All right, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what, what I'm going to call this morning the I cycle. And um, we're going to, going to think about uh, the process that God takes us through. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm trying to get over cold. <coughs> Sure, that was really good for the sound. And uh, the process that God takes us through in our understanding as it relates to us, to ourselves. And, uh, you know, when we start off life, um, and we're, we're just going to look at a cycle here. We start off life, the whole world seems to revolve around us. Uh, we're, we're born, and uh, when we're hungry, we get fed. I mean, when we're hungry... What else in the world's going on anyway, right? When you're in bed, you're hungry. You know, uh, are we concerned that uh, that uh, uh, one of our siblings has a test at school that day, or our parents are out of work, or there's a national tragedy taking place? No, we're hungry, and uh, and we got fed. The whole world revolves around us. You know, our diaper needs change. Uh, the whole world revolves around us. It's all about me. And, uh, and that's where man starts his journey. God starts him with the, with the center of his world being himself. And, and as we move along, I think we, we begin to think that uh, not only does the world revolve around us, but it, seemingly we sit on the throne of our own life. And uh, we envision ourselves as being the captains of our own ship, the destiny of our own fate, and God is scarcely in our thoughts at all. And if He is there, there's an attempt to keep Him at bay as we get older. Because He's confusing to us and He interferes with what we want to do. His thoughts bother us and trouble us. And so, uh, man starts off with this, with this focus on himself. And then, we come to this place where God becomes a part of our thoughts. And we might call this the I and God stage. We recognize that there is a God. We recognize that He's our Creator. We might call this stage, actually, we might call it the religious stage. You know, where, where we think about God and we think about Him being there, we realize that there's a lot of things we can't do as time goes on in our life. We realize that we have failures. We realize that we have problems. We realize that we have a need. We realize that we need something. Something's missing. And it must be God. And yet, this is the stage where I know, I don't think I've seen this bumper sticker in a long time, but when I was a teenager, the popular bumper sticker says, God's my co pilot. Mm -hmm. Well, that's this stage right here. It's me, it's me. And, and, oh, yeah, and God. He's here, he's here with me. I'm in charge still. I got the steering wheel. I know where I'm going. I'm deciding what's happening. But he's there in case I need him. Okay? Because I got, there's some stuff I really need him for, you know? Uh, when when the test time come, I, I really need him, and he's available to me. Um, he's there as my advisor. I keep him in a box. I go to see him occasionally, maybe once a week at church. I go to see him. I go to his house and visit him. And then I go back and go about my business. In the middle of the day, I get in a jam. I call him up and see if he's see if he's available to help me. And, and it's, it's I and God. And then, of course, this process continues, this cycle. Who becomes God and I. And this is the stage where in our development that God is working, this plan He's working in us, that we realize that there's really not very much in life that has any real value except for Him. And without Him in our lives, and in fact every aspect of our lives, life's pretty meaningless. And all of a sudden, He takes the driver's seat and we're along for the ride. This is that stage of life where we seem to think in our mind that we're surrendering our lives to Him. We're saying, you know what? 
we're going to pull over to the next rest stop, and I'm going to let you drive. Because I am making a pretty big mess out of everything. And I can't really just take this pressure anymore. I realize I'm not equipped to run my life. And so we're going to pull over to the rest area, and I'd like for you to drive. So we surrender. This is that stage of our life where we start allowing God to do things in our lives. Right? We allow Him. You remember that? You know, I don't know what stage some of us are all at. Hopefully, hopefully we'll recognize all these stages and you've already been past this one. You know what I'm saying? You know, so I'm, I'm going to start allowing God to, to, to be more important in my life. And I'm going to allow Him to take over. I'm going to allow Him to be a channel in my life. I'm, I'm going to be the channel. He's going to, I'm going to allow Him to do these things. I'm going to allow him passage. And in this place, and it's a funny thing, because in this last stage, he was our advisor. You know, we were in charge, and he, he was advising us. But now in this stage, now we become his advisor. Okay, we're allowing him, and he's in charge, but we're advising him. You know, and we, uh, you know, we pray, and we tell him how he should run things and so forth. We know he's running them, because we're allowing him to. You know, but, 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 but we see there's, there's an advancement going on here. And God's taking us through this process, through this. And then we come, then we come down to this place here. And then it's gone. And we realize here, this is the place where we get the recognition, the realization of the sovereignty of God. And we realize it has nothing to do with us. Nothing. It is all about him. He's large and in charge. He doesn't need our permission. He doesn't need us to allow him to do anything. In fact, Ephesians chapter 1. I love this passage here. This awesome place of, of, of recognizing the sovereignty of God. To realizing that God, God is God, that He is the deity. We were we were talking the other night at Wayland's and we were talking the issue that people have with God not being God. And of course the opposite, by the way, the, the counter doctrine that, that we've had to work with all through here is the free will of man. Free will. There, free will still here. I've just, I've just allowed him. Uh, 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 he's my co-pilot. Even here, I've allowed him to be the pilot. The truth that stands in opposition to man's free will is God's free will. That he saw. You can't have two free. Absolutely free wills in the universe, let alone eight billion That's right. free wills. Somebody's will is free, and somebody's will is constrained. Okay? Now, if you think yours is the one that's free, and God's is the one that's constrained, that's messed up. That's messed up. That's messed up. And man has been duped into thinking that his will is freer than God. Mm. That the creature has more power than his creator. And this is the spot in the cycle of life where we realize his deity and what it means to be God. And one of the things that stops us from getting from here to here is the doctrine of eternal conscious torment. That's right. Is one of the things that stops us from getting here to here. That's and why right. people why people are stuck in this place here and they can't get to here is because the vast majority of God's creatures are going to suffer forever at His own hand. And that God's solution to the sin problem is not Calvary. 
God's solution to the sin problem is isolated torment. He's going to isolate sin off into a dark corner of the universe and torture men and women, his creatures, and, there, children. and children forever. You only have one choice lest you lose your mind or you believe that God is the most evil fiend that ever existed, you're going to have to take the power out of His hands that He has no control of the situation. God has no choice. His hands are tied. God. Okay, wait a minute now. Let's see if we can demonstrate. God. The God of the universe has no choice. His hands are tied. You have to turn him into something less than God. I don't know about you. I always wanted. I always wanted a God who was God. Amen. Always. I wanted a God who was in charge. It was this doctrine that wouldn't let me love him and embrace him that way. I would read verses. I know the verses about the sovereignty of God. And there were times I used to read them and wish I was a Calvinist. Because I would think, man, my, my heart, I'd read them, my heart, my heart would like want to soar that he was in charge and he was running everything. But I knew he wasn't. Yeah. Because look at the outcome. Yeah. It's all up to you. It's all up to me. Oh, man. What, what a day that was when we began. A day. It took me 20 years. <laughs> what a day it was when we realized this. It took me 20 years to realize this. Martin said some of us were on the slow track. You know, it took us 10 years. It took me 20. I was on the real slow track. <laughs> uh, 20 years it took me from the first, the first time it ever... I never heard anybody. I had never heard of anybody who believed in the salvation of law. I wish at least I had known there were some people out there, then maybe that would have been a seed in the back of my mind. I never even knew anybody believed this. And then I read some verses. I read, I read Romans 5, 18, that the same all men that are condemned in Adam are the same all men that are justified in Christ. I said, oh, no. <laughs> Okay. I was a listen. I was a, I was a King James Bible believer at the time. Amen, brother. Yeah. Okay. Which means okay. Which means the rarest King James Bible. Okay. Which means I was an independent Baptist King James Bible believer. Okay. Which this meant. Here's what this meant. You get man. Don't take don't take my message, bro. Y'all are over meddling, all right? <laughs> and and that meant that meant I had been born and raised and taught and trained in Bible college and and was pastoring in this light that the King James Bible was God's advanced revelation and it corrected the Greek and Hebrew. Yeah. Okay. Well, now God used that to my advantage because Romans five eighteen says. Well, let me read to you right here the King James Bible. Don't miss play, you might go to hell. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm glad Kate is very gracious to us to provide us lunch, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that because our time frame is a little relaxed this morning. Because <laughs> we don't have to leave and go anywhere. Romans 5 18. So here's the way, here's the way. And I was always, I'm big, you know, we emphasize the words really strong. On the King James, you know, we're just reading every word because it's off the Bible. Hit it, right? So I read like that. Therefore, by the offense of one Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even, even so, even. Big word. Even. 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 You know, there's a ball game, and it's ten to ten. And what is it? It's even. <laughs> even so, even so, by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men. 
under the justification of life. Uh, uh, how does that work? How's that work? Exactly. Oh, man. I don't really know what to do with it. That was in 1985. It took me 20 years before I could understand what to do with this and stand up and tell anybody else about it. 20 years. That was the first one. Many others began to come along. Many other verses. But what I began to realize in the process, when I learned about the salvation of all, I also learned about the deity of God. That God was in charge. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, that's where I think I originally told you to go and we snuck off somewhere else. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. Uh, giving thanks for you, making mention of, of making mention in my prayers that God the Father, excuse me, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may be giving you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the realization of Him. It's this place where we come to realize who God is. <clears throat> The greatest truth I know isn't the salvation of all. The greatest truth I know is God. Absolutely. The realization of hell. And notice what it says. Paul praying to the Ephesian saints that God would be giving you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the realization of Him, the eyes of your heart having been enlightened for you to perceive what is the expectation of His calling and what is the riches of the glory of the enjoyment of His allotment among the saints. And of course, He continued. But what I want us to look in verse 8, uh, 9, 17 again and maybe giving you, giving you, it's something He gives us. We don't have possession of it. It's not ours. And then He gives it to us. And then it's ours. The people, reason people don't know God, they don't know Him. Let me tell you what. The folks at Mars Hill, where Paul said, I want, to talk, I want to talk to you about that God you don't know anything about. The one that you are ignorantly worshiping. I want to talk to you about Him. When we hear Christendom or any other religion, and Christendom's no better than any other religion. In fact, it's worse. Because it sneaks in. It sneaks in and gets as close to the Scriptures as it can for an imitation. And when we hear them talk about God, you know, and we see it everywhere, it's on our money, in God we trust, right? I saw it on saw it on automobiles on the way down. One nation under God. God bless America. God, 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 God. You know what? They don't know him. I don't know where they're at. They're probably right, they're probably way over here. They may not even be there. But they're definitely not here. And that we learn about Him. Notice, if you will, in Colossians, a parallel passage, chapter 1. Colossians, chapter 1, and verse 9. Therefore we also, from the day on which we hear do not cease praying for you and requesting that you may be filled full with the realization of His will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding, you to walk worthily of the Lord for all pleasing, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the realization of God. There's my story. There's the story of my life. 
you begin to see who he is, and then it seems it's almost a daily growing in that realization how awesome he is, how wonderful he is. We acknowledge that God controls and rules all things, both good and evil, come from His hand. That's what we realize. We realize verses such as 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's run here. I know most of us know these. Let's just remind ourselves quickly of them. Romans 11, 12. What did I say? Yeah, that's I thought you just said Romans 11, 12. Yeah. I'll tell you what we wanted. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5. And verse 18. 2 Corinthians 5, 18. Yet all is of I couldn't believe that in times past, could you? There's a lot of stuff wasn't of God. Of course, that's what I before I realized that He created all these things, He will include it, right? According to Isaiah. I like what A.P. Adams said when he when he quotes Isaiah that uh, you know I the Lord create all of these things, including evil. He said we we didn't write that verse. Isaiah didn't make that up because it says, I, the Lord, create all these things. It's Jehovah who said that. He said that He's the one who created that. If He's the one who said He did it, we, we weren't there, so we take His word for it. That He's the creator of the good as well as the evil. Um, now we'll go to that, uh, roll back to that Romans 11. Word. Romans 11.36. Is the verse we wanted. Seeing that out of him and through him and for him is all. To him be glory for the eons. Amen. Been it a wonderful day that we begin to see these. There, there's a whole line of these. Uh, my, my mind, for some reason, went back to A.P. Adams again. He said, "He said if Paul didn't believe that all things were out of God and that God controlled all things, Paul surely misspoke a lot. <laughs> because that's what he, Paul kept saying over and over again. What a wonderful place that is. But you know, that's not actually the end of the journey of this eyesight." God brings us to a place and He takes us right back to where He starts with us. And there's a lot of people who don't get this. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who begin to see the sovereignty of God, they lose, they seem to lose their personal identity. Yep. And they seem to lose their self somewhere. And then they talk really strange. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's hard to have relationships sometimes with folks. If they if they don't if, if they don't begin to move on to the to complete the cycle that God wants out of us, God didn't create. Right now, there's what eight billion people on the planet, and God didn't create all of us. And every one of us are distinct and different, unique. And He didn't create all of us so that we would just all be Him. He created us to be ourselves, and that's a very precious and wonderful thing. And a lot of times. There will be people that I know, you probably know them too, and maybe they will do something for you. And you'll say, oh brother, I really appreciate what you did. And they say, oh no, it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't me. It was God. <laughs> um, yeah, I know that. But I thank you, that I thank you because God used you. Oh no, no, but it wasn't me. Don't thank me. <laughs> no thanks to me. You know? <laughs> There are no people like that, and you just can't even you can't even have a you can't even be thankful to, them, you know, because they relate everything back to God. Yeah, we we know that truth, okay, and and this is a neat thing. It may surprise some of us 
when we, all you've got to do is get a concordance. Well, the easiest thing to do is get electronic concordance. And just do a search. Do Romans through Philemon and do a search for the letter, for the personal pronoun I. In Romans through Philemon. And in Romans through Philemon, depending on which version you do the word search on, you'll find that almost 700 to 1200 times Paul uses the personal pronoun I. And he uses the personal pronoun me, depending again which version you use, nearly 200 to 300 times. Wow. Start paying attention when you start reading. How many times he uses the personal pronoun me or I? Paul says, wonderful verse, Philippians chapter 1. And this is the verse we need to get. God is taking on us on this cycle. I call it, I'm calling it the I cycle. God is taking on, on this cycle of thinking that everything's about us and we're the center of the universe. And he takes us on this course all the, bigger, all the way back around and he brings us right back to ourselves again in a whole new life. We start off and we're the I and Adam and it's all about me. And it's all about I. And he takes us and cycles us all the way back around. And now it's still about me. And it's still about I. But instead of the I in Adam, it's the I in Christ. And instead of the I of the old creation, it's the I of the new creation. And now listen to this verse. Uh, I should go with you since I don't you to go there. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Uh, Philippians 1, 21. For to me, to be living is Christ. For me, to be living is Christ. Wow! My life is Christ. He's the one living in us. This is the realization that God brings us to. He brings us this realization that the very life we have is His. Oh, you want to talk about a change of life? Yeah. Everything we do, every experience we have is divine. Because it's His life. You know, we get we get the impression that the big the big stuff, that divine moments, how do we want to say it? That the divine moments in our life are big supernatural experiences. Yeah. These are the kind of things you give testimonies about. You know, Christianity's gonna go, oh, I want to tell you, I want to tell you what God did in my life. <laughs> I'll tell you what God did in my life, took out the trash before we left. And come here. I took out the trash, took it to the other shirt. Yeah. We had to clear some snow off the sidewalk. This is the this is the divine life of God in a believer. It's washing dishes, changing diapers, getting the car repaired, making a living, trying to figure out how you're going to pay your bills, <clears throat> trying to get some comfort from your pain so you can go to sleep. These are, the life, these are the divine moments. Every moment is divine because it's the life of God expressing Himself in your life. Paul said, and just to remind you of the passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, Paul says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. Yeah. We doubled up on the uh, personal pronoun, man. <laughs> I actually like that. By the grace of God, I am. That sounds familiar. Huh? By the grace of God, I am what? I am. We're exactly who we are. Mm -hmm. Every one of us. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, 
We might say some of us are off. <laughs> another way we could say it's unique. Yeah. Nuts. Nuts is another way, right? Yeah. Some of us might be disappointed that we don't have certain abilities. Boy, I wish I had. I wish I had what he had. I wish I had what she had. I wish I looked like this person. I wish I acted like that. I wish I had the confidence this person had. I wish I wish I knew what this person knew. I wish I could talk like this person. And will you ever make God ever takes you through the whole cycle? You will be rejoicing that you are what you are by God's grace. You're His unique handiwork. He made you. You are not self-made. You are God made. You're His achievement. You're His hand. Now Paul takes this thing. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll wrap this up. Don't be afraid to say I. Now, I wrote, I wrote 19 books. See? Don't be ashamed. God did. God did. I was just his, I was a humble servant. And I was just a channel. No, no, don't thank me. Thank him. He wrote that. They're not that good. <laughs> See, that's it. Right? Except for the sex book. <laughs> 2 <laughs> Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. Paul says, I have contended the ideal contest. I have continued. Co I, let me get back blurry again. Where am I at? I got lost. I have contended the ideal contest. I have finished my career. I have kept the faith. I did this. I contended. I finished. I kept the faith. Furthermore, there is for me a wreath of righteousness, which the Lord, the just judge, will be paying to me in that day, and yet not to me only, but also all who love his advent. That's how many Paul said, I did this. Paul, you're nothing. Don't you know God did that? Don't you think Paul knew God did that? Of course, he already had that down. He understood that now he had moved on because God wasn't, God wasn't just a sovereign in the universe off somewhere alienated and isolated from himself. He was his life. Now he can talk about himself and it included his life in God. It was God when Paul said that. Do you see that? Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 22. Don't I, we isolate ourselves from God and His life. Listen, we isolate ourselves from God and His life when we separate I from Him now. It's, oh no, no, not me. It wasn't. Oh, he's not in you now. See what I'm saying? It's that cycle. He's bringing us bound. He's he's bringing us right back to that natural place we started. Except now we have the recognition it's it is him, and and our life is his. And now we just talk freely. First Corinthians chapter nine verse twenty two. Notice he says here, uh, it's always hard to find out where to jump in on a concordant, isn't it? Uh, at least when I have my King James, I have my verses all straight. <laughs> while, while ago I was trying to emphasize that point, I couldn't even find it. <laughs> I, became, I became as weak to the weak that I should be gaining the weak. 
I became weak to the weak that I should be gained in the weak. Well, wasn't he interested in God gaining the weak? He thought his life was the life of God. Wow. That's an eye opener. Yes, it is. Romans chapter 11, verse 14. Two more verses. Romans 11, 14. Now to you I am saying to the nations, inasmuch as indeed then I am the apostle of the nations, I am uh, glorifying my dispensation, if somehow I should be provoking of my flesh to jealousy and should be saving some of them. Paul thought he could be saving some people. Most like thinking that was God's job. Is Paul confused? No, Paul knew his life was the life of God. He had made full cycle. <laughs> Listen, your identity in Christ doesn't make you lose yours. It lets you find yours. Yes. 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 We're the only people who really even know who we are. We're the only people who really get to be who we really are. Right. Christ doesn't mask who you are. It magnifies who He's made you and who He is making you. With all your uniqueness. With all that specialty that He's doing. What a wonderful truth that is. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. chapter 7. Paul not only used this, Paul not only used this with himself, but he teaches other people to think the same way. 1 Corinthians 7 verse uh, 16. Now God has, God has called us to peace. Uh, for of what are you aware, O wife, will you not be saving your husband? Saving your husband? He not only thought he could save people, he was telling people other people they could save people. In fact, you know what Paul told Timothy, right? That if he took heed to the truth, he would save himself and those that heard him. Listen, thanks to God. We start off here, we make this cycle all the way around, and we come to this place where everything we do in life is the life of God. What a wonderful place. What a realization of a great truth. Father, thank you for giving us your life. That in you we live and move and are.